Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and our executive producer and research assistant, Laura Cordner, and our engineer is Anita Brockington. That opening song is a little bit from Peter Rowan, our guest tonight from his 1991 album and a tune called Howlin' at the Moon. He can yodel as good as Hank Williams, I think. A few weeks ago, I stumbled upon a random post on Facebook that included a link to a YouTube recording of the Great American Eagle Tragedy, a 10-minute song released by Earth Opera in 1969. Now, this song had a powerful impact on my growth and development, and at the time, it also helped me set my course for the next 50 years. To understand why the song and the album of the same name had this kind of impact on me, you have to understand what I was going through and everyone else was going through in 1968 and 69, what I was immersed in personally, and we'll get to that soon. The song and entire album was composed by our guest tonight, Peter Rowan, who, after Earth Opera, went on a successful solo career as a Grammy Award-winning bluegrass artist, a collaborator with many groups, and a 50-year career of bringing joy to thousands of fans. The other day, I dug up my LP vinyls of the Great American Eagle Tragedy and the earlier album, Earth Opera. Well, I tuned them up very loud and settled in for about five or six hours of therapy. The Great American Eagle Tragedy always makes me cry. The emotion, as expressed, is what a lot of us were feeling in 1968 and 69, and that is, no more war. The next day, I sent an email to Peter Rowan to find out if he would like to talk to us about his work and his contemporary music, and here we are. Beyond his rock and roll music with his band Earth Opera, Peter Rowan has spent a lifetime playing traditional bluegrass music, having trained as a young man with the father of bluegrass, Mr. Bill Monroe. Rowan expanded on all the skills of traditionalism he learned from Bill Monroe and then experimented with many other music genres. He has performed and recorded original and traditional Hawaiian music, reggae music, Tex-Mex, and more selections of which we'll play during the night's breaks. In 1997, Rowan received a Grammy Award for Best Bluegrass Album of the Year for his contributions to the album True Life Blues, The Songs of Bill Monroe. And he has also received six other Grammy nominations throughout his career, as well as many other awards and accolades. But I know him best from his short time spent as a rock and roll singer in the late 1960s during the uprisings of protest against the Vietnam War and the military-industrial complex. As he says, the emotional outpouring he experienced singing those 1960s anti-war songs with Earth Opera drove him to becoming a Buddhist. The calmness and balance he found through meditation have served him well throughout his career, inspiring his songwriting and helping him last for more than 50 years on the road. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, Peter Rowan. Hello, Bob. So nice to hear your voice again. Ditto, ditto. Thank you so much for joining us. How's the pandemic treating you? Well, you know, it's aside from the shock to the system of uh, not uh, planning to travel for over over a year, which for me, you know, I sort of validated my existence on the fact that I could go out and do my music in front of people aside from that <laughs> uh it's been very good uh, a good time for a meditation a retreat kind of album that i thought i was going to be making uh, a year ago it's on hold and so i'm finding you know there's a, a deeper 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 well um, to be found in the process of creating new music so it's in that sense, it's been good for me, you know. I've kind of done, a, I would say, a, a full circle in terms of my approach to the guitar as well. You know, as I had less and less opportunity to go out and play for people, I began to, you know, put lighter gauge strings on my guitars and kind of a, get a little more sensitive feel, and that unlocked a lot of material that... Uh, was wanting to be written, and a lot of material from the past that uh, I'm bringing up to date. So, yeah, it's, it's 
it's been good in that sense. Um, I'm one of the lucky ones. I worked so hard from about for about 50 years on the road that uh, I had some savings, and uh, I haven't I haven't had to sell off all my instruments yet. <laughs> but you know, I mean, if you practice meditation, you're facing what this whole year has been anyway at all mm-hmm. times, yeah. which is you know impermanence and and the changeability of of our uh, perceived reality. So in a, in a way, it's intensified everything for me, yeah. Well, I've been working with a young blues prodigy in the United Kingdom called Toby Lee, designing his new album cover, and I'm hearing from him how difficult the pandemic has made it for performers like yourself and everybody else, and, and uh, their lives have been really changed radically. And probably a lot more about looking inside of themselves. Right. That, I think, may be a key thing that is very positive from the standpoint of the future of our country, but also the future of our planet, because uh, that's what I think we should be concerned with most of all. And I know how most people would say, well, you can't do that, but I think you can eventually. So, as I noted in the introduction, I associate your name with Earth Opera, what some would call psychedelic rock, and I think even you called that psychedelic rock, but bluegrass was your first and longest genre in which you have performed. Let's start at the beginning. What was your first instrument, and how did you learn it? Well, my very first instrument was the ukulele, my Uncle Jim, when I was about four or five years old, came back from the South Pacific where he'd been in the Navy via Hawaii and uh, a place out in Hawaii on the, on the Parker Ranch called Camp Tarawara. Camp Tarawara. And, uh, he, he, uh, and then he ended up at New Caledonia down in the South Pacific. Uh, I think he was in the supply chain for the U.S. Navy. But he came back from Hawaii after World War II and brought a ukulele. He had he brought a Martin ukulele a Martin. that he said he won in a poker game in Honolulu, <laughs> and and he he put us he dressed us up in grass skirts and coconut bras, me and my mom, and and had us dance around in the living room to I want to go back to my little grass shack in Kealakekua, Hawaii. That was my first show. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. Yeah. How wonderful. And, and, yeah, and um, uh, we used to go to a family party with my, my uh, well, the patriarch of my mother's side of the family was her uncle, my great uncle, George Wallace, who was a, you know, he was a man of, uh, of means. He had a house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright and... Oh. Uh, but he was a community-spirited guy, a kind of pan-political person. In other words, he was a man of his times. He, uh, I think he was, you know, he was a capitalist. He was for business. But he had, when he threw the family party every Labor Day, I would go down into his downstairs room. And he, he was a, a tremendous host. And as I say, patriarch of my mother's side, of the, the Wallace side of the family. His name was George Wallace. And they hearkened back to... Robert Wallace of Scotland, I believe. And uh, he had this guitar, and I actually have that guitar now. But it was the most incredible thing, first guitar I ever saw. And it just lay there on this counter, all properly cared for and all. And and in that room, he also had a a Hammond B3 organ and and a piano. And he kept his musical side alive, even though he was... He had Walt Disney cartoon gels on the wall. You know, he was a vastly, well, he's a cosmopolitan person and, a, you know, a capitalist. <laughs> and uh, he had the Fitchburg Paper Company, and he would host these gatherings, and uh, the family gatherings. And that's where I saw my first guitar. And uh, knowing the ukulele a little bit, I could, uh, I could work with the guitar. And then he, uh, at my hinting, uh, actually purchased for me. Uh, it took me to Fitchburg Music, which many people know who from that era. Fitchburg Music was a tremendous music store. And he bought me a, a little Harmony four-string tenor guitar 
with the F holes, and that became my first instrument. My best friend Bob Emery, who was also became a bluegrass player, and I would just you know we walk around the neighborhood playing our instruments and uh, singing duet harmonies. And uh, one day we saw a picture of Elvis Presley on Life magazine with a, his Martin D-18 leather-bound strapped on his back as he leaned over and pointed a, a, a finger and stared into the eyes of this girl who was taking his picture. It was the cover of Life magazine, and we thought, we need to put straps on our guitars. <laughs> <laughs> And we formed a little rock and roll band called the Cupids and started playing around, all around the Boston area at what they call Sock Hop. Was that your first and, uh, band in 56 that you played? Yeah. The Rockabilly? Yeah. You must have been about 13 Richie years Valens. old. Yeah. yeah. Richie Valens, Chuck Berry, Richie Everly Valens. Brothers. Uh, oh, yes. You know, uh, yeah. Buddy Holly, a lot of Buddy Holly. Oh, we were like, we, we were sort of like the Crickets. Interestingly enough, the Beatles also... Uh, you know, mm-hmm. they, they took an insect name because they liked the crickets. You know? <laughs> well, I, I, everyone loved the crickets. Yes. Well, then you traded your acoustic in for electric guitar. Is that right? Well, uh, one of the things my parents did during that era, you know, you have to remember that this was the, during the McCarthy oh, era. My. Oh, my. You know, with the House on American Activities was looming, and a lot of the teachers in the public school uh, were really about, there was a music program, you know, t- once or twice a week we would sit there with uh, the lady at the piano and we'd sing all these songs like Santa Lucia, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, world music, being folk songs from around the world and folk music also was sort of this underground rumble of, uh, of interest and passion for people along with a uh, Oh, everything from having, you know, up in the country in New England, people had looms and they were weaving their own blankets. And, you know, there was an arts and crafts music that was related to the labor movement that connected with Woody Guthrie and the folk music scene that was burgeoning a lot around New York and up in Massachusetts. And and dancing to square dance music was a part of this sort of phenomena of, it was a kind of a back to the roots thing, really. It was like, uh, you know, while the world seemed, as my uncle would have said to me, while the world was going to hell in a bucket, you know, there was this whole idea of uh, do it yourselfness, yes. you know? Yes. Which became, you know, that became the 60s, you know? So in the 50s, there was this, this sense of, uh, you know, there's, they use the word rootlessness, but it was really uh, the movement of looking for your roots was happening then. Mm-hmm. And square dancing is where I first heard uh, bluegrass instruments. Well, really? I'd go out and, yeah, I'd square dance on a Friday night and then ballroom dance on on Saturday. And, uh, you know, the square dancing was, was great fun. It sure was. I, I loved square dancing. I really did. I, yeah. Everything else would, and because it, it was, it's so much more friendly too. I I love right. It. You're, and you're you're moving and changing partners. That's right. the, the, the the thing, you know. And, uh, and I heard the, the banjos and the fiddles, you know. And it, it, but it was what I square danced to. Well, I was on the weekend, you know. As very soon after that, I graduated from. I moved on from ballroom dancing and the first bits of rock and roll were coming in, you know, and we had to learn. I remember the last of the ballroom dancing was the kids all wanted to just jitterbug. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But but dances for kids were happening then. And and because, like, very soon you had the American bandstand on TV, kids learned new dances, and it was, you know, it became the Friday night rock and roll dance. And we began to play music for those dances. Well, we have to take a break right about now. Our guest is Grammy Award winner Peter Rowan of Bluegrass fame. Find a link to his website on our Facebook page for 21st Century Radio. We're going out with a little clip by Bill Monroe introducing Peter Rowan back to his stage after some time apart. And they begin singing the song they wrote together called Walls of Time. Let's take a listen. 
Friends, let's make welcome here to Pete Rowe, an ex-bluegrass boy. Howdy, folks. How about a hand for Pete here? Now, he's been out. What years were you a bluegrass boy, Pete? I forget the years of. Well, 60. Come in. 65 through 67. 65 through 67. Pete's originally from Massachusetts, uh, where I first met him. So bluegrass boys can come from anywhere these days. Yes, sir. I'd like to do one that... Uh, Bill wrote while I was with him. Long one uh, lonely night along the road from Bean Blossom to Nashville and over through Kentucky, he wrote this song called The Walls of Time. and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Our guest is Peter Rowan, and Peter, what was this song all about? Midnight Moonlight was, um, I composed that on a a tour with a band I was in called Sea Train that played around the Washington, Baltimore area a lot. It was a rock and roll band, and in the band was the fiddle player, Richard Green, who had also been in Phil Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys with me. we were part of Bill's band for about two and a half years as the Bluegrass Boys, playing on the Grand Ole Opry and touring with Bill Monroe, the father of bluegrass. How would you define bluegrass music? How would I define bluegrass music? Yeah, well, how would you? Yeah. I mean, there's many levels of bluegrass. Yeah, now. sure. Uh, classical bluegrass would would have to be, you know, in the strictest sense, would be banjo, fiddle, mandolin, guitar. And bass, you know, the five basic instruments. And to that, slide guitar from Hawaii was added. Uh, acoustic, again, all acoustic. And and that has been the the bedrock of bluegrass music. And uh, and I would say then, then you have to have a canon of work that would include mm, probably 50 traditional songs to be a real bluegrass band. And you'd have to play them in, in the original style. And then you could move on into interpretive bluegrass. And the interpretive bluegrass is like, uh, I mean, the farthest extent of that would be somebody like Alison Krauss, who has taken bluegrass ideas into a very, very uh, advanced way and really had a great focus on her special qualities of her voice. But I knew Alison when she was a young fiddle player and uh, uh, sang as well. <laughs> but, um, it, you know... Uh, the music that came out of Alison Krauss's experience was from the Midwest. And the Midwest is really the birth of a lot of rock and roll up there. You know, I mean, the Midwest beginning from the southern Midwest all the way to the northern Midwest. And if you, you know, you drop the plumb line down, I mean, you're going to include Kansas City and by extension Oklahoma and by extension the other way, Nashville. And, you know, all the way down to the Mississippi River and New Orleans, to the basically the Midwest of our country, the Mississippi River, uh, old Indian country, must say, uh, that that is the birth of, of so much music. And uh, But bluegrass itself, I mean, it, it constantly renews itself because although some kids nowadays pick it up and are, are very, very good at it right away, and then they move on. They go on to other things and... a a way to kind of make show business out of what their ability is, because that's the American kind of pathway to success. Uh, But, 
you know, I can tell you right now, two of the best jam sessions in the world would be up in Appalachia when pickers get together, although some of the older generation have moved on, left this life. And the other, the analogous place to hear roots music, uh, well, then you go to Mississippi and there's blues there, but, you know, Hawaii is another place where people do get together and make music for sheer joy of making music. And that's where bluegrass will renew itself, is, is in the people who love it so much they'll give you a chill bump by singing a, a, a line of a song, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's in, a, in a sense, it's not commercial, but it became a music by being a commercial music, by being a music that people paid to go see due to the efforts of Bill Monroe, you know, with his early definitive band, Flat and Scruggs, you know, Lester Flat and Earl Scruggs, Chubby Wise, and Cedric Rainwater. So and, uh, were there many women involved in bluegrass at that time? Well, the thing is that Bill Monroe learned to play the mandolin from his mother. Oh. oh. He was the youngest of nine kids, and they all played the big instruments, and he was the youngest, and he was given a mandolin, his mother's instrument, uh, with only four strings on it instead of eight <laughs> strings, so he could learn. Mm -hmm. And learn he did. But I, my theory is that he, he learned to sing high because, like Ralph Stanley, they both learned from their mother. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they as their voice changed, they were still singing in their, in their mother's range, their mother's vocal range. Yeah. Were there any black musicians in bluegrass? Well, uh, Bill Monroe learned basic musical styles from a black guitarist named Arnold Schultz, who was from New Orleans, would come up to Kentucky and work in the wintertime as a hired hand. And Arnold Schultz and Bill's uncle, Penn Vandiver, who was the fiddler that knew all the material that Bill enjoyed, played together. Arnold Schultz and um, Penn Vandiver. And Bill's, Bill was an orphan, I think, by the time he was, geez, I think, 11, and he went to live with his Uncle Penn, so he spent a lot of time with Arnold Schultz and Uncle Penn. And that's really the beginnings of bluegrass, as Bill was playing his mandolin along with his uncle playing fiddle and, and a black musician, Arnold Schultz, playing guitar. And Arnold Schultz, being from New Orleans, would have known lots of blues. And that's why bluegrass is a perfect name, really, for the, you know, the grassy side is, is the Anglo-Irish mountainside. But the blue side is definitely from the blues, from the, the, the black innovations, the musical innovations in our roots music. Well, thank you. Boy, that, that I really appreciate it learning this. I really have, because I've wondered about these things. Oh, yeah. Bill loved his blues, and he often said, if I hadn't invented bluegrass, I would have been a blues man. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. In 63, you won an audition to play with Bill Monroe as one of the bluegrass boys. Were you still in college when you made that, that trip to Nashville? Well, I mean, it was over a period of time, a great musician and friend Bill Keith, a banjo player, had worked with Bill Monroe, and I used to drive used to drive his Chevy, his hopped-up Chevy, all the way from New England to Nashville once or twice a year to go down there for a DJ convention they used to have down there. And, and it was just for the professionals. There was no crowd. Even things like uh, field guitar showcases would happen for an audience of 10 people just who happened to be in the Fender guitar room Whoa. during four to five in the afternoon. It, was, it wasn't all written out. It was very casual. We would travel to Nashville, because Bill, Bill was uh, also doing a book with Earl Scruggs about the banjo playing. So I, be, I became sort of engrossed in the scene over a couple of years. And then when Bill Monroe came to New England to do a solo show, Bill Keith called me up and had me asked me if I'd play guitar with the band when Bill came north. Mm -hmm. I had already become a mandolin player with Bill Keith and Jim Rooney. But, I, you know, I, I want to just interject one thing and say where I learned bluegrass was in the Baltimore, Washington area. Really? I, I, I left school. During the first half of my junior year, I, in the snowbound hills of Shenango County, co 
Colgate University up in Upper State, New York, I hitchhiked to D.C. because I had heard this group, the Country Gentlemen, and I would play their records all the time. And the reason I loved them is because their harmonies were so oh, yes. so fine, you know. And uh, Eddie Adcock's banjo playing was so special. John Duffy had the high tenor, and Charlie Waller on guitar was throwing the runs in there. And I, I liked that stuff because it was very clear. It wasn't as like Bill Monroe's records had become very much about Bill Monroe as a vocalist, because that's where they were going to sell stuff. But Bill always kept instrumentals alive. So I came down to D.C. and I found the Shamrock Bar, and I looked in that little, on, on, out on M Street in Georgetown, and I looked through that little uh, diamond-shaped green glass window of the, of the Shamrock Bar, and I saw Charlie Waller lifting his D-28 up to the microphone and pounding the classic G-run, and I th- then, it, then it all was like the door opened. It was like, oh, oh that's Whoa. how you do it. Yeah. You got to lift the instrument up and make it make it heard through the microphone, you know. So I kind of still keep to that format. To me, as much as, as you can keep in a bluegrass thing of the original sort of early technological aspect of it. Of course, nowadays everybody's plugged into and all that, you know. But I mean, really, the, the joy of real bluegrass is something very, very special on the acoustic side because it makes people listen more. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as audiences get bigger and bigger and sound and technology needs to be refined more and to have a little more focus, you know, that happens. And, you know, it's not bluegrass, but it's part of the bluegrass expanded aura of musical accessibility and excitement, too, you know. you got bands out of the upper Midwest like Drive-By Turtles that really aren't a bluegrass band, but they're like an old-time band that's become a rock and roll band and... It just, it's amazing, you know? Mm-hmm. It's amazing what they do in their world. But what was life like on the road with Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys? Well, there'd be, there'd be times of, days of silence. <laughs> <laughs> there would be days of meditation on the bus. And then I would take time to ask Bill about his world, his life. And that's where I got a lot of the stories that I relate about early Bluegrass and Bill Monroe's approach as well. Bill was such a boss, you know, that, you know, you just respect him and give him his space all the time. And I did too, and I was very much not wanting to invade his space. But I was curious, and I was still, you know, only 22, so and they called me the kid. <laughs> and I, I was the, the kid. kid. <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, and so the kid can ask questions, because you're the kid. That's right. that's, yeah, that's true. You know, so I stayed the kid, and I got a lot of information from Bill and a lot of background in the music, and we actually wrote a song together called The Walls of Time. Will you tell us about that a little bit? you got a little bit more time. Yeah, no, The we were driving from Nashville with the, all the Bluegrass Boys and this old bus that Bill had. It had a little sign above the front window, you know, there's like a, a tape. It said, the bluegrass special. You know, you, you rolled this thing into a little, little glass window up above the windshield. And we called it the bluegrass breakdown. But <laughs> because <laughs> because it, it often lived up to its name. And, uh, and uh, one morning on the, on, uh, you know, on a Sunday morning, uh, on our way to Bean Blossom to play our Sunday matinee up in Indiana, again, the Midwest, the bus... Uh, lived up to its name and we were stranded on the highway on the edge of a canyon called uh, Horse Caves, big uh, canyon, Horse Caves Canyon, Horse Caves, Kentucky. Uh, we haven't gotten that far and we still had miles to go. And um, I was, I'd been driving and it was about sunrise and I'm sta- I was standing outside the bus. Just I shared with Bill this sort of mystical thing about sunrises and sunsets. Mm-hmm. And, and we bonded over uh, things in nature. And he was, I would say, in my opinion, Bill Monroe was a nature poet who ended up being a bluegrass artist, star, country music star, and all this. But I was standing outside the bus watching the sunrise over the mountains to the east, and Bill walked up to me, and he sang the opening. He said, listen good to this Pete Rones, and don't you ever forget it. And he sang the opening lines of The Walls of Time, and I finished the song, and I felt this sort of 
opening in my relationship with Bill that I was stepping into his territory. And in truth, in reflecting on it through the years and understanding more now than I ever did about that relationship, I, I was slightly invasive in that I became part of a song that he was just getting the beginnings of. Mm-hmm. And I thought it, I mean, it's the first song I ever co-wrote with anyone. And I may have stepped on his toes without knowing it, you know, because he, he was very pr- proprietary about that song. Didn't want for a long time to give me any credit. And, uh, and that's one of those things in the music business, you know, it's like an albatross. You carry that for years. And at first it doesn't mean that much. And at first it's like, yeah, whatever, you know. But then you realize that y- you have a life too. When you're working for a guy like Bill Monroe, you only have a life in relationship to him. Mm-hmm. And that was what was hard for people to work with Bill and stay with him for a long time. You had to have a maturity about you that at 22 I certainly didn't have. But I had the excitement and the inspiration. And he had, I put together one of his best bands. I got the players in there. Now, his son James was already playing bass with him. But I got Lamar Greer from uh, Baltimore. I got him in the band. I got Richard Green in the band, the fiddle player. Oh, sorry. We got to take a break right now, and we'll be back with our guest, uh, Grammy Award winner Peter Rowan of Bluegrass fame, and we're going to talk a little about Earth Opera when we come back. Hi, this is Raymond's Eric of the Doors, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. But the war was grand, a lovely parade. Here is where I long to be. My home, the grave, my land is free. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio with our guest Grammy Award winner Peter Rowan of Bluegrass Flank, Bluegrass Fame. Got that about right. After your, t- I, I like the bluegrass flame. I like that. <laughs> well, we're firing them up here. Yes, indeed, indeed. <laughs> I'm sorry. So after your tenure with the Bluegrass Boys ended in 67, did you willingly switch to playing electric rock and roll, meaning was it your idea, or, or did someone have to convince you to do that? Well, I will tell you, on my last gig, my last show with Bill Monroe was at Whitey's Zebulon Lounge in Baltimore. Whitey. And and it was that tape you can hear that stuff online now and we were so keyed up in that show that it was it was brilliant you know it was like i'm about to be you know walk the plank and not be part of it anymore uh, but the power that we played with on that night was and i think bill especially was really giving me a send off you know mm-hmm. and uh so I moved back to Massachusetts, and David Grisman had come back from the West Coast, where he had recorded some of uh, with the Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead, and he brought back a record. I think they were called the Grateful Dead by then, or the Warlocks, but they had done a song called Cold Rain and Snow, and I used to do that song with Bill Monroe. And Cold Rain and Snow became one of our our big songs, one of my solo songs with Bill. And when I left, it became a, a part of the material I started playing in Earth Opera with David Grisman. Now, we started out with acoustic instruments. We wanted to be like the great American, uh, what was it called? The, incredible String Band? The, the Incredible, yeah. We were, we were thinking more along the lines of the Incredible String Band, who were also on Electra Records. But what happened was our culture was moving along so fast that when it came time to do any kind of live performances, they started putting us with the doors. Oh, so we went goodness. from so we went from an acoustic duo to a four piece electric band with horns. 
And when we finally made the record, it was a contemporary record with bass and drums rather than a bluegrass record because we, I mean, quite honestly, couldn't really get any work playing bluegrass at the time. I, I mean, bluegrass was, if you were just going to live a, a straight life and maybe have a day job, you could play bluegrass on the weekend. But we were full-time musicians by then, and we were believing in the dream, you know, the, the whole visionary quality of the 60s. Was Earth Opera and, your first rock and roll band? Well, after the Cupids. I mean, when oh, I was Cupid. 14, I had uh, the Cupids, which was a rock and roll band. But, you know, I'd gone into the acoustic side of things, loving the music of Lead Belly oh. and hearing hearing that type of music in the context of Bill Monroe, which was, you know, had the harmony singing and it was more accessible to me. I, I still have a, my own repertoire of the blues that I learned back then and Really, one of the people I learned from was uh, Josh White, who was a, a player during that, those times. Oh, my, yes, Josh White. Yeah. And again, you know, tying that back in with the whole Woody Guthrie thing and the labor movement, you know, mm -hmm. the House on American activities basically destroyed Josh White's career. I mean, he, he, he hardly could get any work after he had to testify from the House on American activities, but he called Pete Seeger the night before he had to go to D.C. And Pete said, Josh, it's okay. You know, they had him over a barrel, and Pete knew that. He just said, go ahead, man. Whatever you have to say, he said, I mean, none of this blackballing is going to mean anything because you st you stay with your beliefs. Right. Of course. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I, I had had this blues influence for a long time. And, and when I came out of Bill Monroe, you know, I stood next to the fire for two and a half years. And my inspiration was pretty high coming out of there. And I'd written a lot of songs in Nashville that just were not going to be country songs. Because it was the 60s, you know, we just, it was natural to become a, a rock and roll band. But uh, the music we played was more mood, moody music. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really rocking a lot yeah. of it. But we, we managed to get some up-tempo stuff in there. Uh, a lot of it was very kind of uh, what they called the earth opera was referred to as an underground sound. Yes. You know what I mean? Just way down below surface was this, this sound that we were making. Well, earth opera was signed by Jack Holzman to Electra Records. And, and with your self-titled debut album, your group frequently opened for The Doors, who were also on Electra Records. This is when I first met you. When you opened yeah. for the doors at Meriwether Post Pavilion here in Maryland, I was so-called local celebrity of sorts, I guess, yeah. becoming known in Baltimore as the spokesperson for hippies, even though I wasn't a hippie. I was just an artist. That's all I ever was. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, but people assumed that I was because my hair was long and I wore cowboy boots and I wore cowboy hats and that, that kind of thing because I loved them. He yeah. was just a long-haired artist painting gigantic murals full of esoteric symbolism and teaching about the Aquarian Age and all that stuff. And I was also, right. be, also being courted by executives of the Electra Records to design album covers for them, but that, I didn't get along with that too well. So I, that, that was the end of that. But, boy, I will never forget how jealous Jimmy Morrison was, Jim Morrison was, when it became by the absolute frenzy you created in the crowd when you performed that 10-minute American Eagle tragedy. Everyone was just blown away. Uh, but Morrison, unfortunately, was unhappy about being a little bit upstage. I heard that from him. I wondered if you had similar memories of Jim Morrison from, from when you opened for the Doors on that tour. No, uh, Jim, my encounter with Jim Morrison was once he saw who I was, and I saw who he was, and we, we were fine. That's but we good. didn't hang out. But there was, I'm surprised to hear you say that because, you know, I never had, being in the public eye at that time, in a sort of unknown new world that was developing, and opening for the doors was extremely challenging. I mean, it was great, but we always felt like, good Lord, this audience is here to, for the doors. And but it, but hey, I have to say, the doors inspired me to become a, a much more 
aggressively outward performer. Because during the American Eagle tragedy, I mean, we were all over the place. We'd got, become an electric band by then. Mm-hmm. When we first opened for the Doors, we were, we were still semi-acoustic. But over the time, that's what I say, it, 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 this brings back so many memories, because over the time, the, the year and a half that we toured at different times with the Doors, we were changing so fast from, you know, an acoustic kind of our own sense of listening to a band that could adapt to those audiences that they were playing to. And they were a full-on rock and roll band, and Earth Opera was, oh, they referred to as art rock or something like this. But we began, the thing is that none of the people in that band was exper- were experienced as I was. I had already been playing rock and roll, but mm-hmm. we were not a dance band. The Doors, you know, had been through, you know, seasoning at the Whiskey A Go-Go in L.A. as a probably firstly a dance band playing for people to dance and then becoming a showcase for Jim Morrison's poetry. So I would say I got hugely inspired by Jim Morrison. I've never even thought about it. Thank you for reminding me because it was really during the touring with the Doors that we became something that could do, we became a musical entity that could perform the great American Eagle tragedy. I never even thought of this before, Bob. Um, well, absolutely I- inspired by Jim and his stage presence. I mean, you play with a guy like that night after night. I wasn't trying to, and there's no sense of upstaging. It was like, this is what the, they're opening the, the door. They're opening the doors to this uh, expressive music to this new group of people that are no longer bluegrass people in the South in their 50s and 60s, but these are teenagers and young kids in their 20s, and those they're my contemporaries. So that's what that was all about, was I had become come back from Nashville, from Bluegrass, into a world of my contemporaries, who are my audience. And definitely the doors opened the, the door for Earth Opera. That's when we became a, an electric band, and and we wanted to stir the crowd. Oh, you the war, did. You know what I mean? You did. I, I mean, I, do you yeah. realize? Can you? I bet you you don't remember what was going on when, after that happened. They, people were jumping up and down and saying, "I can't more." They wanted to hear more. That's what caused the problem with Morrison at that time, because they wanted more of you. And I felt embarrassed because I didn't know what to do, uh, I, I, because you know that was my favorite song, obviously, and everyone else responded like, "You hit it right on the nose for that entire group." It was thrilling. It really was to see, and you and they were growing up. These people in Baltimore, you know, they, there's a lot. They they all thought they were hip and all that, but there's just a lot of things that they were not involved in. They weren't involved in meditation and prayer or, or helping. And but I heard about that from so many people afterwards for days. Hey, can we play a little bit of that right now? Please, yeah. Okay. And call out the border guard. The kingdom is crumbling. The king is in the counting house, laughing and stumbling. His armies are extended, way beyond the shore. <laughs> As he sends our lovely boys to die. Yeah, yep. This is the end of the Imagine that going on for 10 minutes. You know, I, so many people had tears in their eyes because they knew what this song meant. Right. By then, we, we, were, we were losing friends overseas at the war. Yeah, 
the war hung heavy on our hearts at the time. Yes, sir. Well, uh, that's why bluegrass. That bluegrass to me at that point was irrelevant to the social issues of the time. Mm-hmm. And although I never gave up on bluegrass, it just wasn't you. The bluegrass audience from that moment on to Earth Opera and Olden in the Way, that became the new bluegrass audience that that it is now. You know. I mean, it's funny that I dovetailed back into bluegrass with Jerry Garcia and Dave Grisman still, you know, not five years later. five Less than five years later, we were on the West Coast playing bluegrass with Jerry Garcia and Vassar Clements and reclaiming bluegrass for the purity of, of bluegrass. Well, we'll pick that up next hour because we're out of time for this hour. Our guest is Grammy Award winning Peter Rowan, who is telling us about his 50-year-long career in music. Whoa, PeterRowan.com. In fact, we are going to close the hour with a little clip from that band, Old and in the Way, with their song of the same name, recorded live at the Boarding House Nightclub in San Francisco in 1973. That's Jerry Garcia on the banjo. Holding in. 